Ooh, that's a bingo. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Fuck! The way you say it, that's a bingo. You just say bingo. Bingo! How fun! How fun indeed. Episode 52 is here, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nate Chacon the uh, If this is your first time, welcome. If it is not, then the retention program is working. What I do on this podcast is I'm a glorified narrator to stories you have heard and stories you have not. I'm, uh, it's like Audible, sort of. So, uh, let's get into it, man. Uh, so, last week... We dropped the premiere episode, episode 51, from Mary L. Trump's book, uh, Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man. And um, I still feel the same way that I I felt when I read it, Uh, just that kind of dirty feeling or whatever. Um, But I certainly appreciate everyone that watched, the comments, everything. Uh, I know how much, you know, we appreciate it and certainly paying attention. Um, with that in tow, I did forget last time that I, I have a couple things that I want to say, actually. I said that the, I said the book was fiction. I was like, it's not stories, it's fiction. Fucking, it's non-fiction, that story, but the too much and never enough. So there's that. I want to start with that. And then also I forgot our random Twitter follower shout out that I do on every single episode. So we're going to do that right now. Let's see who it is. Now it's already fuck it up and I don't give a shit. Okay. Um it is at Hollywood Reason, uh founder of DiMaggio Entertainment. Uh oh shit, it's KJ. Word up at Lane Visions. Okay. Um his his uh link will be in the description below. I hope you guys registered to vote as well, but um, yeah, so today, episode 52, we're going to read from James Baldwin, uh, Collected Essays, right here. The Library of America is, is who uh, published this book. They're a non-profit publisher. Um, their main mission is to, like, preserving America's, like, authors, like, best and most significant uh, writing in enduring volumes as it were and uh so when i picked this up it even has like the you know the little place mark there i love it i love it but um there's countless essays in here from james baldwin i think it's it's super relevant to what you know what we're going on in the times uh today is f- for sure what we're going to be reading today is the discovery of what it means to be an american so um i haven't read it entirely uh honestly just read the first uh, paragraph and it's going to be, it's going to be good. I mean, it's obviously going to resonate things. This has not been the situation that we're in now with, um, the divide or what have you, um, you know, it's been a struggle, uh, for hundreds of years. And, um, so this is going to be a time frame to reflect. Um, and James Baldwin is definitely a consummate, uh, professional in how he writes. He's, he's, if you haven't heard of James Baldwin, all good, um, but you definitely should uh, brush up on your knowledge of James Baldwin. Um, he's, he's uh, again, just an incredible individual, incredible author, incredible writer, and um, someone that we're you know, definitely going to be uh, reading more from because this whole book is like a ton of essays. So um, you know, we're going to have a lot to, to do with with James Baldwin in the future. But today we're going to read the discovery of what it means to be an American. All right. I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, of course, extra T media, extra terrestrial media or video, excuse me, media. Sorry. Extra terrestrial media. Good God. Um, if you need to film a music video, record an audio single, uh, get a drone shot of your business or home. Uh, you're looking to sell your house. You need a dope shot of your, of your crib. Um, They have a range of services to help any artist or anyone in need. So visit extratmedia.com. And, yo, you know, so right here, all some of the merch that's on there. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Sometimes they're funny and sometimes they're sad. Most of the time they're funny because I hate to be sad. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. But don't take my word for it. Spare fingers. Yes.
Okay. All right. Okay, the discovery of what it means to be an American uh, by James Baldwin. Um, before I get into that, there was a couple other things I wanted to mention. Again, thank you guys all for the support. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please do um, hit the bell and uh, the subscription or like and like the video. Uh, you know, it definitely helps or what have you. But yeah, um, certainly appreciate it. all those in in. Uh, Audio land, obviously, you know, I love rocking with you. I've been rocking with you and all that. So, you know, we're in the building, as it were, you know? Fucking. I don't think you, you have, have any no idea, idea how fast I really am. I'm fast as fuck. Woo! Boy. All right, let's get this shit started. All right, it's a complex fate to be an American, Henry James observed, and the principal discovery an American writer makes in Europe is just how complex this fate is. America's history, her aspirations, her peculiar triumphs, her even more peculiar defeats and her position in the world yesterday and today are all, excuse me, are all so profoundly and stubbornly unique that the very word America remains a new, almost completely undefined and extremely controversial proper noun. No one in the world seems to know exactly what it describes. Not even we motley mi uh, millions who call ourselves Americans. I, and this is this story is about. I mean, he's going to go into it. It starts with "I left America." Uh, James Baldwin lived in France for a, a duration of time, um, and then came back to America. But and there's a story um, of why he left in the first place. But I left America because I doubted my ability to survive the fury of the color problem. Color problem here. Uh, duh. Uh, sometimes I still do. I wanted to present, prevent myself from becoming merely a Negro, or even merely a Negro writer. I wanted to find out in what way the specialness of my experience could be made to connect me with other people, instead of dividing me from them. <sighs> Just even saying that, you know, that's like, it's so powerful to just be put into writing that he just wants to be a part, you know, rather than be defined by him being a Negro, like his experience being so delicate to the fucking social fabric of where we're at today. Oh man. Um, I was, I, I was okay. Da, 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 da. I wanted to find out in what way the specialness of my experience could be made to connect me with other people instead of dividing me from them. I was an isolated front. I was, I was as isolated from Negroes as I was from whites, which is what happens when a Negro begins, at bottom, to believe what white people say about him. In my necessity to find the terms on which my experience could be related to that of others, Negroes and whites, writers and non-writers, I proved to my astonishment to be as, an Amer as American as any Texas GI, and I found my experience was shared by every American writer I knew in Paris. Like me, they had been divorced from their origins, and it turned out to make very little difference that the origins of white Americans were European, and mine were African. They were no more at home in Europe than I was. Hold on, let me reread that, because that's powerful. Huh. In my necessity, okay, in my necessity to find the terms on which my experience could be related to that of others, Negroes and whites, writers and non-writers, I proved, to my astonishment, to be as American as any Texas GI, and I found my experience was shared by every American writer I knew in Paris. Okay. Like me, they had been divorced from their origins, and it turned out to make very little difference that the origins of white Americans were European and mine were African. They were no more at home in Europe than I was. Damn. The fact that I was the son of, uh, the fact that I was the son of a slave and they were the sons of free men meant less. By the time we confronted each other on European soil, then the fact that we were both searching for our separate identities when we had found these, we seemed to be saying, why then? Why then we would no longer... Hold on, hold on, hold on. When we had found these, we seemed to be saying, why? Then we would no longer need to cling to the shame and bitterness which had divided us so long. Just tearing down those walls, you know? It became terribly clear in Europe, 
as it never had been here, that we know more about each other than any European ever could. And it also became clear that, no matter where our fathers had been born, or what they had endured, the fact of Europe had formed us both was part of our identity and part of our inheritance. I mean, obviously, you know, Europe was, uh, you know, the fucking, Br the sun never set on the British Empire, you know, so I, I would imagine that that has something to do with it and how, how so many, I mean, you know, the slave trade was cracking for a long time and I'm, I'm being as uh, delicate as I can with that, but like, for him to for him to to type to write that out and have the you know cognitive cognitive uh, mindset of being like like we're I have the same kind of issues in Europe that I do in in America except that you know in America there's still that that social divide that is not as prevalent in Europe I mean you got to remember Europe has been it, uh, they've had social their their social fabric has been in for much longer than America's 400 years for America, you know? So yeah. Anyway, I had been, uh, I had been in Paris a couple of years before any of this became clear to me when it did. I like many a writer before me upon the discovery that his props have all been knocked out from under him, suffered a species of breakdown and was carried off to the mountains of Switzerland there in that absolutely alabaster landscape armed with two Bessie Smith records and a typewriter. I began to try to recreate the life that I had first known as a child and from which I had spent so many years in flight. It was Bessie Smith, through her tone and her cadence, who helped me to dig back to the way I myself must have spoken when I was a pickaninny. Ugh. You know? And to remember the... And I'm only I'm referring to pickaninny as, you know... Uh. And to remember the things I had heard and seen and felt. I had buried them very deep. I had never listened to Bessie Smith in America. In the same way that, for years, I would not touch watermelon. But in Europe, she helped to reconcile me to being a... N-word. And I'm just going to do that. And we're not going to, you know... Um, I do not think that I could have made this reconciliation here. Once I was able to accept my role as distinguished, I must say from my place in the extraordinary drama, which is America, I was released from the illusion that I hated America. That's deep. That's really deep to come to on that realization. Let's, I want to read that one more time so I can understand how that clearly played out. I do not think that I could have made this reconciliation here. Once I was able to accept my role as distinguished, I must say from my place in the extraordinary drama, which is America, I was released from the illusion that I hated America. Okay. So disconnecting himself from America and the, the illusion or excuse me, the, yeah, the illusion, um, from the drama that's created in America, from the divides and like the social fabric that we're referring to. So he's able to distance himself from that and be like, okay, hold on a minute. I'm, you know, I'm me. I'm James Baldwin. The story of what can happen to an American Negro writer in Europe simply illustrates, in some relief, what can happen to any American writer there. It is not meant, of course, to imply that it happens to them all, for Europe can be very crippling too. And anyway, a writer, when he has made his first breakthrough, has simply won a crucial skirmish in a dangerous, unending, and unpredictable battle. That sounds like that sounds like when an, like that just sounds like an artist plight. Like when you make your first song or something, or your first album, which I'm doing right now. Uh, but um, and you get over that that stigma, and you finally like break through or what have you. But then realize, I don't want to say it like this, but I'm going to because it's 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 sad a little bit. But you realize that like that whole battle that you had either with yourself or with people around you for for whatever reason, why you didn't release what you wanted to release that um, it might have it might it didn't matter really like all those walls and barriers that you put in front of you. So to just go with what the fuck you want to do. And now you're published and now you have a song on the internet or now you have a song streaming. So good for him. Um, still 
the breakthrough is important. Boom! And I, ooh, dude, I called, I, dude, I was, and I, that's how I felt to it. I said that. I just said that, dude. Perfect. On my Perfect. part, you know? Um, still, the breakthrough is important. And the point is that an American writer, in order to achieve it, very awesome, ooh, excuse me, very often has to leave this country. So he's already, um, he's already back in America when he's writing this. I'm going to, we're going to put a, I'm going to put a, a pin in that really quick. I'm just going to read like the first paragraph for, because there's an introduction to these essays and I'm just going to read the first paragraph. Um, these essays were written and this gives context obviously to, you know, the stories. Um, these essays were written over the last six years in various places and in many states of mind. These years seemed on the whole rather sad and aimless to me. My life in Europe was ending, not because I had decided that it should, but because it became clearer and clearer as I dealt with the streets, the climate, and the temperament of Paris, fled to Spain and Corsica and Scandinavia, that something had ended for me. I rather think now, to tell the sober truth, that it was merely my youth, first youth, anyway, that was ending, and I hated to see it go, as we all do. In the context of my life, the end of the, my youth was signaled by the reluctant realization that I had, indeed, become a writer. So far, so good. Now I'd have to go the distance. Okay, so that's why I wanted to read that as a context because he was coming into his own as a writer, which is what he's you know explaining here about that breakthrough that he had um, in order to make that happen. The American writer in Europe is released, first of all, from the necessity of apologizing for himself. It is not until he is released from the habit of flexing his muscles and proving that he is just a regular guy that he realizes how crippling this habit has been. It is not necessary for him there to pretend to be something he is not. Ooh, bro, that is, that is, I got you, homie. You know what I'm saying? It is not until he is released from the habit of flexing his muscles and proving that he is just a regular guy that he realizes how crippling this habit has been. It is not necessary for him there to pretend to be something he is not, for the artist does not encounter in Europe the same suspicion he encounters here. Whatever the Europeans may actually think of artists, they have killed enough of them off by now to know that they are as real and as persistent as rain, snow, taxes, or businessmen. And that's, again, oh, whatever, man. I'm hitting fucking mics over here. Um, that goes to what I was saying about, like, the history in Europe. I mean, you know, um, quick thing that comes to my head is, like, absinthe, you know? And the the galleys of artists that would... Um, come or that would uh you know come to a, a location to to write or to just get fucked up on absinthe um but like artists have long been uh and my and my watch is going off and that's okay i don't give a shit i'm not gonna take it off mid-show um but artists have long been known like have long been persecuted in their efforts and things of that nature so like i i i, I feel what he's saying when he says that in europe that they're like, I don't, whatever, man. He also is, you know, a tax attorney, but he's a fucking amazing painter. So that's tight. All right. And that's, again, goes to what I was saying about, like, being able to, like, distance yourself from essentially, like, your ego, I guess. And just being like, I can just do what I'm doing and, you know, go from there. Okay. Um, but this tra tradition does not exist in America. On the contrary, we have a very deep-seated distrust of real intellectual effort. Probably because we suspect that it will destroy, as I hope it does, that myth of America to which we cling so desperately. An American writer fights his way to one of the lowest rungs on the American social ladder by means of pure bullheadedness and an indescribable series of odd jobs. He probably has been a regular fellow for much of his adult life, and it is not easy for him to step out of that lukewarm bath. Oh, man, that's just so pretty, like, how that description is, you know? Like, how things have just been so easy. Like, you know, having a job or, or like, having a 9-to-5 where you have your 401k set up and insurance and things of that nature. Um, and to step out of that and just, like, be in the cold, essentially. And that is something that's very deep to me. Um, yeah. We must How Okay. Uh, he probably has been a regular fellow for much of his adult life, and it is not easy for him to step out of that lukewarm bath. 
We must, however, consider a rather serious paradox. Though American society is more mobile than Europe's, it is easier to cut across social and occupational lines there than it is here. This is something to do, I think, with the problem of status in American life, where everyone has status. It is also perfectly possible, after all, that no one has. It seems inevitable, inevitable in any case that a man may become uneasy as to just what his status is. And that's like so true because like status is everything, you know, pecking order at a job place or pecking order even in your family, um, you know, status. Stat- and we've talked, I've, I've, I've read so many different stories of, of folks that, God, it's the Amer- it's like the American underfabric to to have status. Living the American dream is having status. If you if you you know want to get granular about it, it's not it's not like something that I'm just pulling out of my ass here, huh? I love reading and like having those moments. I don't know how. I like how how James Baldwin writes, but I was going to say I love reading and like having those moments of like, aha, just being like, wow, like it touched me in a different way, you know, because that's that's different. I haven't really thought about that because these are these are like these essays that have been compiled. They're more like how how do you how to like. They're not even like short stories, really. They're not. They're more describing. I mean, there are some for sure, but. But they're more describing what a almost like a journal entry for him most of the time, and then they turned out to just be, uh, you know, th- words to to read and to take in like I am right now and dive dive right into them. So, yeah, where every so I want to read that last part where everyone has status. It is also perfectly possible, after all, that no one has. It seems inevitable in any case that a man may become uneasy as to just what his status is. But Europeans have lived with the idea of status for a long time. A man can be as proud as uh, a man can be as proud of being a good waiter as of being a good actor and in neither case feel threatened. And this, I, you know what, in the comment, like, as you guys, were, or, you know, send me an email, short story, bingo at gmail.com. Um, I'm, I don't know. I haven't lived in Europe or, you know, I don't have many European friends, but that seems like, you know, uh, is it like that carefree? Like, is it just, uh, is it that deep? You know, that it's not, I mean, I, does that resonate in my head as I'm thinking about it with how, like, in, like Greenland and like, well, you know, with the socialism platforms that are, that are more often uh, used in European in in Europe, like, you know, universal healthcare uh, systems and things of that nature. Like, I think that, I think, I think socialism probably is a big reason for some of that because they are of the, mindset that we're all in this together maybe and that you as a waiter um are no less than me as you know a a businessman or a doctor or something i don't know it's kind of hard for me to like wrap my head around because i'm so fucking american you know it's just deep, deep to me um okay a man can be as proud of being a good waiter as of being a good actor and in neither case feel threatened. <clears throat> and this means that the actor and the waiter can have a freer and more a freer and more genuinely friendly relationship in Europe than they are likely to have here. The waiter does not feel with obscure resentment that the actor has made it. God damn. See, I nailed it, dog. Uh, and the actor is not tormented by the fear that he might find himself tomorrow. Once again, a waiter. Boom. You you know what? Honestly, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, give myself a round of applause. Yeah. And also that's for James Baldwin. But like, yeah, that's crazy to me. That's great. I would love that. That would be awesome. You know, I don't because I I feel the same way. Like if I know I've I'm humble. <sighs> Shit, there's that. Um, 
what's the best way to say this without sounding like, well, I'm humble enough. And, um, I just know that like, if I, I could lose everything tomorrow, that's the best way to put it. I just know I could lose everything tomorrow. And so things that I have now, I'm very grateful for people that I have in my life. I'm very grateful for. And I know also that at a time in my life, I was definitely not grateful, uh, for what I had around me. I off, I on often, um, sit back and look at things that I've accumulated, like things, inanimate objects, and also just people around me and, um, and bask in the gratefulness, man. So that's great. But I definitely am not above knowing that I could go and be in like a different place from where I'm at now, whether it's, you know, financially or, uh, where I'm living, you know, things of that nature. So that's great. Um, this lack of what may roughly be called social paranoia. So beautifully put, um, social paranoia causes the American writer in Europe to feel almost certainly for the first time in his life that he can reach out to everyone. That he is accessible to everyone and open to everything. This is an extraordinary feeling. He feels, so to speak, his own weight, his own value. It is as though he suddenly came out of a dark tunnel and found himself beneath the open sky. Hmm. I'm gonna. I've already found myself just sitting back, listen, like as he's writing this, and like, man, dog, this is like me. I'm the writer, you know. And I know that there's a lot of people that feel the same way, like just being able to have that breath, that social paranoia. That's something that is now locked into my vocabulary as a, something I'll be like. It's just a great, great description for what we encounter with with classism and status. Can you say statusism? Is that an ism? Statusism? Well, with statuses, there's that social paranoia. Wow. It is as though he suddenly came out of a dark tunnel and found himself beneath the open sky. And, in fact, in Paris, I began to see the sky for what seemed to be the first time. It was born in on me, and it did not make me feel melancholy. That this guy had been there before I was born and uh, would be there when I was dead. And it was up to me, therefore, to make of my brief opportunity the most that could be made. Yo, let's go. Let's go, dog. And that's what's up. I love that. I was born in New York, but I lived only in pockets of it. In Paris, I lived in all parts of the city. On the right bank and the left, among the bur uh, bourgeois and among Les Miserables, and knew all kinds of people, from pimps and prostitutes, and Pigai, P-I-G-A-L-L-E, I don't, okay, to Egyptian bankers in, god damn, in New, New Ely, New Ely, N-E-U-I-L-L-Y, New Ely, that's what, that's what we're gonna do, yeah, this may sound extremely, so anyway, he knows a bunch of people, all right, he knows a bunch of people. He's seen a lot of shit. Okay. This may sound extremely unprincipled or even obscurely immoral. I found it healthy. I love to talk to people, all kinds of people. And almost everyone, as I hope we still know, loves a man who loves to listen. <laughs> this perpetual dealing with people very different from myself caused the shattering in me of preconceptions I scarcely knew I held. So judging. The writer is meeting in Europe people. Uh, excuse me. The writer is meeting in Europe people who are not American, whose sense of reality is entirely different from his own. They may love or hate or admire or fear or envy this country. They see it, in any case, from another point of view. And this forces the writer to reconsider many things he had always taken for granted. This reassessment, which can be very painful, is also very valuable. This freedom, like all freedom has its dangers and its responsibilities. One day, it begins to be borne in on the writer, and with great force, that he is living in Europe as an American. If he were living there as a European, he would be living on a different and far less attractive continent. This crucial day may be the day on which an Algerian taxi driver tells him how it feels to be an Algerian in Paris. Nice. It may be the day on which he passes a cafe terrace and catches a glimpse of the tense, intelligent, and troubled face of Albert Camus. 
Is that a real guy? Let's look him up. Albert Camus. Um, and do, do, Albert Camus. And Camus is spelled C A M U S. Albert Camus uh, was a French Algerian philosopher, author, and journalist. I, I ran into that one. He won the Nobel, Pro Nobel Prize in Literature at the age of 44 in 1957. The second youngest recipient in history. Damn, that's what's up. Camus was born in Algeria to French Peds, uh, Pied Noir parents. His citizenship was French. Okay. So he was born in Algeria, but to French parents. All right. And uh, that's where I deduced it to. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he, that he was the second youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize in literature. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, let's do this. Okay. This crucial day may be the day on which an Algerian taxi driver tells him how it feels to be an Algerian in Paris. <clears throat> it may be the day on which he passes a cafe terrace and catches a glimpse of the tense, intelligent, and troubled face of Albert Camus. Or it may be the day on which someone asks him to explain Little Rock and he begins to feel that it would be simpler and corny as the words may sound more honorable to go to Little Rock, Little Rock than sit in Europe on an American passport trying to explain it. I could see that. Someone in Europe asking, uh, you know, James Baldwin about Little Rock. Everyone knows. Well, not everyone, but, uh, you know, the Little, uh, Little Rock 6. Hold on. I used to live in Little Rock, actually, when I was in the Air Force. Oh, Little Rock 9. That's what it was. Yeah, the Little Rock 9. Right? Hold on. Should make sure. Yeah. Yeah, Little Rock 9. I mean, yeah, Little Rock Central High in 1957. Yeah, that's that high school is actually still open and runs just like a regular high school. It's incredible when you go out there and see the high school and then uh, pull up YouTube videos of that scene of the students walking in. Um, and uh, it's like when I was there looking at the at the high school again, mind you, I was, you know, there on in the air force. So I, I was there like when the first time I saw it strictly, I like definitely just as a tourist, even though I was living there for quite some time at that point and to have the YouTube video up while standing, like almost like in the same spots is surreal almost, you know, like almost out of like out of body type of thing. You're like, damn, this is where it happened. You know, but so much, um, so much history, man. Oh, there's a person. Okay. Okay. Or it may be the day on which someone asks him to explain Little Rock and he begins to feel that it would be more simpler and corny as the words may sound more honorable to go to Little Rock than sit in Europe on an American passport trying to explain it. This is a personable day, a personal day, a terrible day, the day to which his entire sojourn has been tending. It is the day he realizes that there are no untroubled countries in this fearfully troubled world. That if he has been preparing himself for anything in Europe, he has been preparing himself for America. In short, the freedom that the American writer finds in Europe brings him full circle back to himself with the responsibility for his development where it always was in his own hands. Hot! Damn, dog. Perfect. 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 Um, even the most incorrigible maverick has to be born somewhere. I love that. He may leave the group that produced him. He may be forced to, but nothing will efface his origins. The marks of which he carries with him everywhere. You are where you come from, bro. And you grow from that. You know? So that's, yeah. I think it is important to know this and even find it a matter for rejoicing. As the strongest people do. Regardless of their station, on this acceptance, literally, the life of a writer depends. The charge has often been made against American writers that they do not describe society and have no interest in it. They only describe individuals in opposition to it or isolated from it. Of course, what the American writer is describing is his own situation. But what is Anna Karenina describing, if not the tragic fate of the isolated individual? At odds with her time and place. Oh, yeah, what is Anna describing? Well, who is Anna Karen? Karenina. Oh, is it a? It's a movie. Oh, it's a novel. But it was published in 1878. Okay, 
uh, by Russian author Leo Tolstoy. Many writers consider Anna Karenina the greatest work of literature ever. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to have to read. Uh, yeah, I'm going to grab that. Um, and Tolstoy himself called it his first true novel. It was initially released in Cyril Summits from 1873 to 1877. Damn, many writers consider Anna Karenina the greatest work of literature ever. It doesn't say like of the eight, you know, of the 19th century, just as ever. Okay. Okay. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, like, a, I, I don't have a lit degree or anything. Okay. So I don't know what Anna Karenina is. I know some of you are like, Oh, you didn't know that. No, I didn't know, but now I know. And I'm going to get the book. My bad that I'm, um, 140 years off. Hey, what happened? Yeah, I know. Me too. The real difference is that Tolstoy was describing an old, okay, cool. Was describing an old and dense society in which everything seemed to the people in it. Okay, hold on. The real difference is that Tolstoy was describing an old and dense society in which everything seemed to the people in it, though not to Tolstoy, to be fixed forever. Mm, yeah. All right. So he was taking a, you know, an outside approach and look to it. Go, dope. And the book is a masterpiece because Tolstoy was able to fathom and make us see the hidden laws which really governed the society and made Anna's doom inevitable. Damn, I'm, I'm very excited to read that now. American writers do not have a fixed society to describe. Ooh, the only society they know is one in which nothing is fixed and in which the individual must fight for his identity. This is a rich confusion, indeed. And it creates for the American writer unprecedented opportunities. That the tensions of American life, as well as the possibilities, are tremendous is certainly not even a question. But these are dealt with in contemporary literature, mainly compulsively. That is, the book is more likely to be a symptom of our tension than an examination of it. So the words that are coming from are just like, like you, we fill them and rather than, it's like a journal entry. That's what, that's what I was saying earlier. The time has come, God knows, for us to examine ourselves, but we can only do this if we are willing to free ourselves of the myth of America and try to find out what is really happening here. Every society is really governed by hidden laws, by unspoken but profound assumptions on the part of the people, and ours is no exception. It is up to the American writer to find out what these laws and assumptions are. In a society much given to smashing taboos without thereby managing to be liberated from them. Just kidding. Uh, in a society much given to smashing taboos. I can't believe I just said just kidding. Of course I'm kidding. You know? Uh, in a society much given to smashing taboos without thereby managing to be liberated from them, it will be no easy matter. It is no wonder, in the meantime, that the American writer keeps running off to Europe. <laughs> he needs sustenance for his journey and the best models he can find. Um, you know. Hey, what happened? In a society much given to smack... Oh, excuse me, right there. He can find. Europe has what we do not have yet. A sense of the mysterious and inex uh, inex inexorable... Inexorable... I can I know that that's Europe has what we do not have yet a sense of the mysterious and inexorable oh my god I nope that's not gonna work that's not gonna work for me I we're gonna find out how to pronounce that and that's fine we're gonna figure it out right now inexorable, inexorable. there you go inexorable. you know inexorable. one more time just for good luck inexorable. there we go okay uh, okay, it's no wonder in the meantime that the American writer keeps running off to Europe. He needs sustenance for his journey, and the sustenance, you know, substance, needs fucking new stories and shit um, for his journey and the best models he can find. Europe has what we do not have yet. A sense of the mysterious and inexorable. Limits of life. What does inexorable mean? Not capable of being persuaded by entreaty. Relentless. Not to be persuaded or moved by uh, entreaty. Unyielding. Unrelenting. Okay. Um, uh, a sense of the mysterious and inexorable limits of life, a sense in a word of tragedy. And we have what they sorely need, a new sense of life's possibilities in this endeavor to wed the vision of the old world with that of the new 
It is the writer, not the statesman, who is our strongest arm. Though we do not wholly believe it yet, the interior life is a real life, and the intangible dreams of people have a tangible effect on the world. That is it, folks. Uh, yeah, that is James Baldwin, What It Means to Be an American, one of his uh, collected essays. One more time. Um, wow, man. Uh, I was very serious when I said I didn't uh, read that. I, want, I wanted to. I haven't read a lot of his essays, to be honest. Uh, really any. Um, beyond, like, a paragraph here or a paragraph there. It's really important for me to... Uh, start reading more of him because of how profound he is. Um, I pulled up a clip uh, of James Baldwin where he has a really profound um, just message in an interview. We'll play that right now. And there are days, this is one of them, when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. Damn. How precisely are you going to reconcile yourself to your situation here and how you're going to communicate to the vast, heedless, unthinking, cruel white majority mm. that you are here. I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. Mm. These people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I had basis on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become, in themselves, moral monsters. Damn. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird time we're in, man. Uh, I think it's always a weird time. I think that's always been said for a long time. It's like, a, you know, it's a weird time we're in. It's a weird time we're in. But it's, it's really to note to vote. Make sure you vote. Register to vote uh, if you have not. Um, I said in the last podcast, I said, um, uh, I'm going to put a link for you to vote. I, I get so caught up with like how to say shit. I meant to put, I, I'm putting a link in to register to vote. It's right at the top. So um, very, if you, you know, have an issue with it, I don't know, you know, if I can pull up a YouTube video on how to do it, but just click the link and it'll start. Like you can just go through the steps on how to do it. But, um, I wish everyone well, I hope, uh, things are going in your favor. Um, I hope this, uh, story finds you in good health. Uh, my name is Nate Chacon the third, make sure to check out extra T media, uh, Um, again, extraterrestrial media. If you have a single that you're dropping, uh, you know, a video that you want to have done for your music or um, you're trying to sell your house or you just need some good video work. You need to get a photo shoot set up. Um, hit them up. Extra Team Media. My man George Life is heading that up with a, with his team as well uh, to make sure that that's, that's uh, you know, artists and, and folks are being taken care of. They they offer a lot, you know, a wide range of services. Also, email me, shortstorybingo at gmail.com if you have suggestions on stories that you'd like to hear comments um email me let me know what's up i really listen and read uh, excuse me i read them all i mean i listen i mean if you want to send like an audio message then fucking do that you know um and then follow me on instagram uh at gabino underscore grimes uh that'll be here somewhere and then uh at short story bingo as well uh as new content continues to roll out so yeah so, so, um, excuse me short story bingo Episode 52. I felt like I was saying studio. That's what I fucking felt like. Anyway, yeah, episode 52. Uh, James Baldwin collected essays. Um, yeah, and we're out. Dun, dun, dun. Spare fingers. Yes.